Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. But it, it truly is an honor to be here. Trish, thank you for having me back. Commissioner Hunter, to be a, a citizen in the state of Tennessee, to be somebody that works with TDEC and TDOT and our jobs every day and finance administration, to see this level of learning and development go on at state government is very impressive. And I'm always honored to be here and be just a, a little part of it with you. So uh, Trish asked me to share a bit of my journey with you all today. And you're going to find some parallels in that from what you've already heard from the other leaders. And I think you'll, you'll see that as we go through here. Now, I have split this up into four different acts. Now, they're fairly quick acts, so I'm not going to keep you too long. But defining moments is our first piece. These are moments in my life that really helped shape a young Bobby Higgins as I was getting started on my journey. And then this idea of leadership being a high-stakes game, it's important. As you become leaders, you become responsible for people, their careers, their development, serving the customers, the clients. And there's a lot at risk in that, and I applaud all of you for putting your name in the hat and saying I'm going to take that on. And taking that on is the part of us that we all have to go all into it. And we have to be committed to that as a leader. You can't be half in and half out. And we'll talk about that for a minute. And then overall, what I think is the payoff that every leader really appreciates. So these defining moments for me, it was the uh, first day of summer. I was a 12-year-old boy coming out of my parents' house. I looked down the lane at Reservoir Drive. My mom and dad lived, and there was my grandfather. He was a preacher. He was a carpenter. He had an old GMC pickup truck. You could recognize it a mile away. and had a camper top on it. So I had learned, even as a 12-year-old boy, that Papa was purposeful. He was deliberate. And if he was coming to visit, something special was about to happen on this Saturday morning. And so I watched with anxiousness as he pulled past the drive. He backed that truck in. He got out. He had a smile and an element of pride about him. And he opened the hatch on that thing, lowered the tailgate, and, and there it was, a 21-inch Murray push mower <laughs> <laughs> with Pitts hardware tag still floating on the handle in the breeze. But he said, I got Mr. McCrone's yard, and you get the rest. And he had a little different plan uh, for my summer. But I am so <laughs> thankful for that interaction of my grandfather. I took that one interaction and turned it into 20 different lawns that I mowed all over Lewisburg, Kentucky, because he took interest in me as a leader, as a mentor, and helped me develop. And I tell people it's no wonder. I'm a consulting engineer. I trade consulting services for a fee. I learned at 12 years old how to trade services for a fee and how to meet a customer's need and take care of your resources and be on time. And so it's no wonder I'm standing here before you today thanks to that interaction. And to me, it represents the power that we have as leaders, as mentors to others, to change the course of their life overall. So I'm thankful for that. I'll fast forward just a minute here. I'm uh, about to take the ACT exam. I have a little longer and thicker hair back then. <laughs> a little bit, well, just a little bit, but uh, yes, the mullet thing going on. Um, I'm filling out my ACT form, and you know, you had to select the colleges that you wanted it to go to. I was thinking about engineering. My dad did electrical maintenance work, and I thought about electrical engineering. So I said, uh, there's my driver's license. I said, um, <clears throat> Make sure that Rose Holman Institute of Technology gets my results. That was a top 10 engineering school in my day. And then MIT, they're going to want to be interested in what little Bobby Higgins scores <laughs> on that ACT. And being from Kentucky, I had to put Big Blue you know, down there, right? So don't judge me on that part. But um, when the results came in, and that whopping 23, um, I didn't hear from Rose Holman. I didn't hear from MIT. Uh, maybe a 35 or 36 might have got me there, but I didn't, I didn't hear from them. And UK didn't offer me any money to go there, so I ended up enrolling as a commuter student in Western Kentucky University. This is 1986. I signed up uh, for their, another picture of my student ID. I teased uh, my wife fell in love with that man, so just uh, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> that young guy right there. So um, so I signed up, and I'm commuting. I'm going back and forth. I'm in the engineering technology program there at the school. And it's fast forward to December. 
and I'm out to the mailbox ahead of my parents to pick up my transcript, and it's kind of a thicker envelope, and that first score, didn't, that, that decimal point is in the right place, and that first score, it, it didn't go so well, okay? And there was a letter attached that Mr. Higgins, we regret to inform you you're on academic probation, and we'd encourage you to focus more on your studies this next semester. I showed that to my parents, convinced them that I need to move up there, get in the dorm, be closer to the action. You know, maybe that might. <laughs> Y'all see where this is going, right? So, and I'll redeem Trisha the minute for having me here in front of you all. You're like, but now, what's Trisha brought in front of us here today? So fast forward now to the May, end of May, and uh, yeah, I'm very transparent leader uh, here, so. <laughs> So now there's a thicker envelope and it says, Mr. Higgins, I regret to inform you, but you've been academically suspended from Western Kentucky University. And we'd like for you to take a semester off and think about your studies, because you're clearly not thinking about them while you're at school. So here I am now, what are my options? I'm Mountain Tires at Sam's Wholesale Club. I am working third shift at Minute Mart, frying that chicken people were coming in, you know, before they go off to breakfast. And I drive by a recruiter's office for the United States Air Force. And I go in, I say, I need a plan for my future. I get a haircut overall. That first haircut was a lot more than that one actually, but got a haircut. My dad would say that I almost followed in his footsteps. Here's a picture of him in the Army. He spent three years in the U.S. Army. This is in Washington on a deployment and I joined the United States Air Force, all right? Now, that first haircut was a dollar and 10 cents. I still remember the head being completely shaved and uh, it was a real op eye-opening experience for this young man. We all stood out there in the parking lot. We dropped our bags and they screamed at us and shaped us for the next six to eight weeks and really helped develop me as a young man and give me the discipline. Now imagine, how familiar does this sound? You learn to work with people from all walks of life, to train together, to work together, to play together, and accomplish a goal together. Is that what we do every day, right? So I was stationed in Warner Robins, Georgia, the 5th Mobile Combat Communications Group, and that just means we stay deployed all the time and supported Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So here, i am uh, got a video of my homecoming. I'm coming back from the desert. It's been a 21-hour plane ride home. My wife is anxiously waiting for me. I tease her about that Bon Jovi haircut, but that was the style. <laughs> she hates it when I show this video, but she's not here uh, today, so we're safe. Um, she's nervous because you're not sure if your airman's going to be on the plane. It might have got bumped. We didn't have cell phones and could have got bumped off somewhere on the way. Maybe didn't arrive, but she's out there, and I literally had 21 hours to think about what's next for me. My enlistment was up in about six months. And as I stepped off that plane and I hugged her for the first time in seven months, I was a very focused young man. I was going to, I was going to go back to college. I was gonna do something with this gift that God gave me because three of my teammates didn't get that opportunity to come back home and they're over there still today. And so that was important to me not to squander this and to get serious and use the skills that I learned. So try to redeem myself a little bit. I left the United States Air Force, went back to Western. My wife finished up her degree. I transferred to Vanderbilt University, and this is me graduating with honors uh, and getting uh, good grades finally. Uh, there, thank you. <laughs> so a lot of courage along the way in that journey. My wife framed that uh, honor society uh, thing on my neck there for me, so I have that as a reminder of that turnaround in my life. While I was at Vanderbilt, I needed a job. I was married. The only thing I got out of that first year of college was my, what was my fiance and became my wife. And what she saw in me, I have no idea why she took a chance, but she did, and I'm grateful that she did. So here I am, uh, first day in 1996 at Barge. I needed a job for the summer. I had worked for a utility. I'd worked for the Department of Highways in Kentucky. I had done other various engineering type work and I wanted to work for a private consulting firm. I was just checking the box. But what I found was a group of people that really cared about their work. They cared about what they were doing. And I found a place I could build a career ultimately. And here is my first day in 2009 as the CEO. 
and you can say, oh, well, he went from intern to CEO, you know, from working at Minute Martin Mountain Tires to, to CEO. But it took a lot of help and a lot of involvement, a lot of that courage and staying focused on your team and all those sorts of things to help make that happen for me personally. And sure, I'm excited, right? But now let me show you to the, the next phase here, the high stakes nature of leadership and what it was for me and our company. You see, in January, our board of directors fired our, in January of 2009, our board of directors fired our CEO and COO. We had, had very flat growth or even down. We had no revenue, profits, nothing was going on very well in the company. And they fired those folks. I remember the CFO comes into my office that January of 2009. He says, Bob, the board has voted to keep the search internal and your name came up. I was like number four on the list and my boss was on the list. I didn't know that at that moment. And he said, are you interested in applying for the job? Wasn't on my radar screen, wasn't looking for it. I was leading the water services division at that time. And I said, Tom, I, I think I am, but let me go home and talk to my wife because that's a family commitment. And I want to make sure she's on the same page before I go home and just surprise her that that's what's about to happen. So I went through a rigorous interview process and came out on top of that May 19th, 2009 with our company. So here we were, 54 years in business. At that moment, we had a lot of great tenured employees. We were at $50 million in revenue, but that had been on a downward uh, spiral from where we had been. Nine different offices in the southeast, and we had a bit of an unhealthy culture problem. And to give you an example of that, it's the morning of my interview, that Tuesday morning. I'm getting out of the shower. My wife says, this guy's blowing up your phone. And it was a client of mine, said, you know, early in the morning. And he says, Bob, I hear you got an important interview today. I said, well, how'd you figure that out, Mayor? I didn't tell you. He said, uh, well, you got somebody in that room that's not for you. He said, they just called up here and tried to get some dirt on you. And that's what was going on in our company. And this was my client, our customer of our firm, right? So that's where our culture was. It was a bit not focused on talent, not focused on being courageous. It was focused on numbers. And we didn't hit a number, we'd have a new set of numbers. It was good people. Don't get me wrong, I'm not throwing off on anybody else before me. They just, people can get in a rut. People, good people can get in a rut and get kind of their own group thinking going, not taking outside opinion. And we can get in trouble and get trapped as a leader if we don't have people around us that challenge us and help us grow and get better. We didn't have any unity. We operated as really nine independent companies underneath that barge umbrella. And again, we had just come off of, no, we're an employee-owned company. There was no stock growth. There was no bonuses, no raises. Morale at our firm was pretty well at an all-time low. And congratulations, Bob, you're in charge now, right? <laughs> First day on the job. First day. And I remember the night of the interview, I had, uh, I'll talk about starting with the right team in a second, but. I had put some names in an envelope of people that I felt needed to leave our company quickly because we weren't going to change. This was talked about a little bit earlier about getting the right team around you. And I learned a lot about that in the military, making sure the team is all headed toward the mission, toward the goal. And I put all those names in the envelope, I signed it, sealed it, and I handed it to the CFO. And I said, Tom, I'm going in for this interview. If I'm successful, and I didn't want people to say, well, you fired me because I didn't vote for you. I didn't want that going on. I said, if I'm successful, we'll come back. We're going to open that list together, and we're going to read it, and then I'm going to get to work. If I'm not successful, it better be unopened when I get back, and we're going to shred it back together. And you're never going to know what was in that envelope, right? So uh, that was how we started, and I still remember that ride home uh, that evening. It was like, whew, I made it. Whew, I made it. <laughs> now I've got to go and do something. And it took a lot of help and a lot of courage with a lot of people. So, again, $3 million in debt and a $5 million credit line. Payroll was a half a million dollars a week. And, again, I told you about morale. We had about four weeks of operating capital. And this is a firm been in business for 54 years. A lot of people revered out there and never knew we were in that sort of trouble at that moment. So, remember the recession that you know, happened? The worst economy since the Great Depression. The economy wasn't there for us. It wasn't an abundance of work like we had at the moment. So that was stacked against us as well. And I want to share this with you. Uh, I saw this in 2014. 
The top 200, 225 firms gather once a year in New York City, and we share benchmark data and survey data. It's a really neat group from the billion, 90,000 person companies all the way down to the you know, top 500, which might be $50 million or less. And we're invited to that group. I'm sitting there. Paul Zoffness leads that group. And he says, I want to do something different this time. I want to communicate to you all what we're seeing in the industry. And he said, these are the top 40 firms in the year 2000, greater than $100 million in revenue. And he shows us this list on the screen. He says, what do two-thirds of those companies have in common 14 years later? And he says, they're gone. They're not in business anymore. Now, some of those firms, they wanted to be acquired. A couple of folks started the company, wanted to become a part of a bigger you know, conglomerate, and ultimately that was part of their plan. And many of those firms didn't manage their profitability, they didn't manage their risk, they didn't manage their retirement programs, they didn't manage their talent, they weren't growing, they were growing too fast or too little. And he began to go over what he had seen in his 27 years experience of what hurts a firm. And at Barge, if I look back in that year, we had pretty well checked the box red on many of those pieces. And it was just a reminder. And last year, the number one firm on that list got acquired by another company because of financial trouble. Okay? So that's what, to me, the high stakes game of leadership, that you've got this amazing, incredible opportunity, and we've got to go all in on it. Whether you lead a small group, I remember my first promotion at Bars, client manager. I led seven people, Trish, and they're like baby birds in the nest. I had to bring work in and feed them. That was my job to be that person. It wouldn't be the cab guy's fault or, you know, the person doing the surveying's fault if we didn't have work for them to do. It'd be my fault. And I just remembered that responsibility as I progressed through our organization. So, again, this idea that we must go all in as leaders and commit to this wonderful opportunity we have and I'll talk about that payoff in a second so I want to share now you know this opportunity that we have as leaders I want to share some of the tools and some of the thinking that I had that I think the team everybody got behind that ultimately saved our company from extinction and you're gonna you're gonna hear some familiar things that you've already heard from these other fine leaders that you've had as a company you have to learn to adapt you can't stay stagnant you can't stay stuck in your own way of thinking. The winds are going to change the climate, the people, the talent, the market. You can't just be guaranteed it's all going to be the same all the time. And you have to learn to adapt. So this idea of a business cycle as you start a business, it grows and it develops and matures. If you don't change something about it or adapt to those current conditions, it will begin to decline. And that's where we were at Barge at that moment in 2009. But we were fortunately able to catch that, maybe a little on the downslope, and turn it back around, adapt, and reinvent ourselves. And I love what was said about bold transformation. We needed bold transformation in our company. That was critical for us. So, to me, that all begins with knowing who you are. Trish, I'm sure they've had assessments in this, this program, and it may have shown some things about you. You knew, you may have taken that home to your spouse, and, and they say, that's exactly you, you know, right? That's a good barometer check when you're in denial. I'll just ask Michelle. She said, no, Bob, that's, that nailed you. That's you, right? So, or my 12-year-old daughter. One of them will be on it. They'll be straight up with me all the time. So, but it's the idea of knowing who you are. That moment that the CEO, the CFO, asked me to apply for that job, like, can I do this job? Can I really do this job? Now, you don't always know that, right? But does it fit me? Does what's needed at Barge, does what's needed for this team at this moment fit me? And then what doesn't fit me? And where will I need all the help to get around me? Who will I need help from? What will I need to reinforce the areas that are not my strengths? And I can live in my strengths and help move this company forward. So same thing in your department. Same thing in our company. We had to be honest where we were in the marketplace and where we weren't. And what could we build on, right? You have to really have that sort of come to Jesus meeting with yourself and with your department, your firm. Where are you? What's working? What's not working? And where could we be? Now, once you know that and know where you want to be, it's our job as leaders to cast that vision and communicate, 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 and build the buy-in for it. I traveled to every single office, and I gave every employee the same presentation that I gave the board of directors who hired me. I communicated every piece. I said, you're getting the exact same thing that I gave them. This is what we need to do as a firm.
And I had spent four months prepping for that interview, talking to shareholders, employees, clients, regulators, talking to other CEOs, listening to the organizations. Because a lot of times you know what you need to do. It's just do we have that courage to do it, to reset and get serious about it? And we needed to make that happen. I needed that buy-in from the company. So communicating that vision is important. Remember, I love what the commissioner said about model the way. When you become a leader, small group, large group, company, people pay attention to everything you do. And you will have the culture that you model. Bottom line, it can't fit you. That culture is good for you, but I'm going to do something different because I'm the boss. Not if you want trust in your organization, not if you want people to follow you. Barge needed to focus on its people. What was good for the people was good for me, and it was good for the people around me. That was very, very important. Just remember, you're always under observation as a leader. You're not off duty when your people are around. So they have to understand what you model is what you expect them to model. Okay? So please, that's a very important piece. This idea of communication. Um, I learned from a Lipscomb professor who does our leadership institute on the communication day. It says, Bob, sent never equals received. Never. He said it never. Even right now, you're assigning your own meanings to the words that I'm using, right? I'm trying to use my hands, gestures, slides, these different channels that I have to be able to communicate to you. Communication, in my estimation, is the most important thing that weaves an organization together. In the military, yeah, it was the rank and the file, and you know if you stepped out of line, you were going to go to jail. You know, be breaking big rocks into little rocks. So that, that helps keep you in line a bit, but but really. People can vote with their feet. In two weeks or less, one of your greatest people could be working for your competition or another entity. So the communication, the better we communicate, the better we get at it, that's the thread that weaves us all together. And that doesn't mean send an email, send a text. You have to use every channel available to you to communicate. Video conferencing, Skype, there's so many tools that are affordable today as leaders. We really have no excuse. But I even see it in our own organization as being absent some time that we need to make sure we double down on our communication efforts, okay? But sent never equals received. You have to work at it and use those different channels to communicate your meaning so your team gets behind that vision, sees what's in it for them, buys into it, and charges forward with you. Because somebody said the definition of leadership is, you know, somebody, look over, somebody's following you. If they're not, you're just out for a walk by yourself, right? And that's no fun. So, unless you need a little break. But anyway, so, just starting with the right team, I think it's one of the biggest mistakes that a leader makes is depending on that existing team for too long. I love what you can do with the Improve Act now, Commissioner, and how you can manage the state government workforce and deal with performance, support performance. But you got to put as leaders, you'll be judged, your success or failure to me will be judged by the people you put around you. I love what they said about you cannot know everything. Back in the day when Barge and Wagner and Sumner and Cannon founded our company, it was an apprenticeship style of leadership. You'd work all week long, you'd go in there on Saturday morning, you'd present your drawings, and if you had your questions, if you could answer their 10 questions, you get to go home early. If you didn't, you had to go back and fix them. They were the smartest guys in the building. It's not that way. I am not the smartest person in the building at bars by any shape, form, or fashion. And we have to learn how to ask questions and ask why and put the right knowledge workers and right people around us and then challenge